event. Grant, okay. Good morning, everybody. It is still good morning. Um, welcome to your Scottish Parliament. Uh, I'm Emma Harper. I'm one of the MSPs from the South Scotland region, and uh, I want to welcome you all to the Festival of Politics. This is the 20th year of provoking, inspiring and informing people of all ages and from every walk of life to engage in five days of spirited debate. And I look forward to this discussion and hearing from everyone, everyone's thoughts and their views this morning. It's important that everyone is given the opportunity to contribute, even where there may be differences of opinion. And that's OK to have differences of opinion. Um, we know that... Uh, um, when we all get to contribute, that helps just enrich us even more. I'm delighted to be joined today to participate in this Health Creators event in partnership with the Cross Party Group of Health Inequalities and Voluntary Health Scotland. And later I will be inviting all of the audience to get involved with questions and comments. And if you're keen to throw your thoughts out there, you can do so by using at visit Scott Parle on X, formerly known as Twitter, and at Scott Parle on Instagram. So today, um, I am very pleased to be joined by Tejesh Mistry, who is the Chief Executive of Voluntary Health Scotland and Board Member of Sport Scotland. He's passionate about addressing inequalities within society and has a wealth of experience within the third sector, leading national behaviour change programmes, developing impact frameworks, partnership development and strategic communications. Also on my right here is Wendy Sinclair Geeben. Geeben. Wendy has worked in the fields of immigration, prisons, education, prisoner transport and health and believes her role as HM Chief Inspector of Prisons for Scotland is the culmination of all of her experience. Her role is to provide confidence to, it, that prisons are contributing in the widest sense to a safer community. And then on my right is Danny Boyle. Danny is the Parliamentary and Policy Officer at Bemis. Bemis aims to address inequalities by, by empowering communities, working towards an inclusive society by establishing structures which recognise diversity and empowers ethnic minorities and ensuring that they are fully recognised as a valued part of the Scottish multicultural civic society. Peter Kelly, on my left, is, uh, joined the Poverty Alliance in 2002, becoming director in 2004. He is responsible for the overall day-to-day -day management of the organisation. Peter represents the Alliance in a variety of forums and networks, and Peter is also company secretary on the board of the Alliance. And finally, uh, Marie Marie. Aldman is Chief Executive Officer of AMA Birth Companions. It's a Glasgow-based charity that works to improve pregnancy, birth and parenting outcomes and experiences for people facing inequalities, including those with insecure migration status. Marie recently co-chaired the Scottish Government's Short Life Working Group on Racialised Inequalities in Maternity Care Unity. So that's our panellists here today. Um, some of you may have been to this uh, Festival of Politics before, but if it's your first time, I hope you enjoy it. So um, we're going to have uh, some five minutes opening from each of our panellists. I will time you, and uh, I've... Arrange, I'll do a pen wiggle when it gets to near the five minutes time and that way it will signal that uh, you're almost up because I'm sure everybody will have lots to contribute and say. And so first um, we're going to basically set the scene around health creators and, and what do we mean by prevention and how the policy rhetoric and ambition about prevention can become more of a reality. Um, each We've had a wee chat before we started, but I'm going to basically hand over to Tejesh to open it up and then we will uh, follow on from there. So thank you, everybody, and welcome. Thank you very much, Emma, and good morning. Really nice to see you all here today. 
Um, I wanted to just, um, I guess, cover a little, a few reflections um, since coming into post just a few months ago, um, and hopefully start to think about how we can narrow the conversation because it's such a broad uh, area that we're talking about here today in health inequalities. Um, Emma just highlighted a bit of my experience and, and working within kind of behaviour change programmes, uh, a real focus on social connection, um, thinking about physical activity, sport, the use of the outdoors, and nature, and that's so that's my natural go-to in terms of my toolkit, thinking about health creation. That's where my mind wanders to and thinking about the opportunities within that. Um, we, between us, I think we'll paint a picture today about what health inequality means for people in Scotland, and we've all got different perspectives. So I'm quite interested myself to kind of learn about the insights and the stories which are really helpful for us to understand what those experiences are really like for people uh, within our communities. Um, the picture is relatively bleak. You know, there is a rise in, in poverty. We know that statistic that nearly a quarter of children in Scotland uh, live in poverty, um, an increase in what we might call material deprivation, so people having those basic uh, standard of living, access to goods and activities. Um, that gap is widening and unfortunately exacerbated um, by uh, the COVID pandemic and cost of living crisis. So it is a challenging um, climate that we are within. And um, the statistic that I always think about in terms of activity and physical activities around actual healthy life expectancy, um, the differences are really stark in Scotland, you know, between sort of 25, 26 years, depending on which area uh, you grew up in uh, and lived in. So that kind of, um, you know, very much from your, the difference being, you know, from your late 40s through to your early 70s if you grew up in, in a disadvantaged, deprived area versus one of the more affluent parts of Scotland, and I find that really stark. It makes me think about my childhood and, and seeing my grandparents when I was a child and noticing three out of the four did live into their 80s and 90s, but for as long as I knew them, they had very limited mobility, a very poor standard of living, um, and it makes me think about that, that impact. Um, we talk a lot about the, the whole system and whole systems change. Um, and I think that's, that's quite scary because it's huge and it's multi-layered and it's really complex. Um, we hear about that, those phrases of, of multiple and complex needs for individuals. Um, and we talk a lot about the social determinants of health being the causes of health inequalities. So everything from income and employment and health, housing, all of those things layered upon are become a very complex picture. Um, and one of the things I would like us all to try and think about is that distinction between the definitions of what equality is and what equity is. Um, and equality, I guess, an analogy around uh, maybe trying to access our local GP surgery where, you know, the doors are open and you can book an appointment and that's all well and good. Everyone has that opportunity to do so. But the reality is for a lot of people, it's not that simple. We may not have telephones. They might not have access to transport. They may not be uh, digitally savvy. Um, they may not have um, support to, to actually get on the line and find that information. So when we talk about equity, we talk about meeting people's specific needs um, where they may be disadvantaged. Um, I quite like there's a new practice at the Scottish Government at the moment looking to develop new models called uh, getting it right for everyone and getting it right for every child. And I think that's a really interesting uh, concept and something that I hope will continue to develop. Um, and, and what it means for the individual is um, the people who support me take the time to listen and understand me as a person. And we collectively consider how my whole life then makes decisions ab about my health and social care. So it's very much about that individual. So I suppose going, going full circle and thinking about um, health creation uh, and what really kind of um, got my mind ticking was around um, one of the social determinants in terms of the social context and the community context um, that people live within. Um, at Voluntary Health Scotland, we support a national network of community link workers. Uh, they're workers that are based within um, general practice settings, within GP surgeries or the wider community, and they support people to access wider facilities and activities that could impact on their health within that field of what we might call social prescribing. So what, what activities can we help people access to? Um, 
And that could be anything from sports and active travel, healthy walks, um, bike rides, those sorts of things. The arts are obviously within the context of the Fringe Festival and Edfest and the range of opportunities. There's a healing arts festival taking place this week and a lot of conversations around the range of therapies that people might be able to access as part of that. Um, and then there are things about food and nutrition um, as well. So endless opportunities within that space and what we can maybe do within our communities. Um, so let's all think about what we can do, who we're thinking about, our neighbours, our communities, our families, and what our role is. And I'll just finish on uh, a small quote. I was actually at a, a Fringe Festival event a couple of weeks ago, um, led by the social commentator and rapper, musician Darren McGarvey. And um, it reminded me of, of, of something. So the, the idea that the grass isn't always greener on the other side. The grass is greener where you water it. So what can we do to water the grass? What is our role uh, as people within our communities? Thank you. Thank you very much for that opener. Um, I will be a little flexible in the time because, uh, because I think it is worth hearing what everybody's saying. Marie, we'll come to you next. Thank you. I like that. I really like that quote. Um, yeah, so I'm the CEO of AMA Birth Companions, and we're a relatively, relative to some of the organisations represented here today, we're a relatively young organisation. We've been around for five and a half years. Um, we are Glasgow based and we exist to support people during the perinatal period, so during the uh, latter part of pregnancy, during birth itself and in the early postnatal period. And many of the clients, as, as you'd said in your intro, Emma, many of the clients that we support are, um, well, they're, they're all marginalised and living in poverty. Many of them are migrant women, in fact, most, and many in the asylum process or with refugee status or with, um, with no recourse to public funds. So there are a range of challenges and existing trauma that, that, um, that people have experienced when, when they come to us, when they're referred to us during pregnancy. Um, we, many of them don't speak English as a first language and, and many uh, don't speak any English at all. So interpreter provision is something that we talk about a lot and I'm sure we might um, touch on that when we talk a bit more about racialised health inequalities. Um, Many of the, the people that are coming to us have no, you know, we've touched on that idea of community already and I'm sure that will come up much more, but a lot of the people that we support have no support network of friends and family around them, hence their referral to us for, for support during uh, the perinatal period. A lot of the people that we support are also survivors of trafficking. We estimate around a quarter, although we can never be absolutely sure, but we, we estimate around that number. Many also, you know, that overlaps with gender-based violence and sexual exploitation. So there are a range of, um, a really a range of existing challenges and trauma that people are, are presenting to us with. I'll just say a little bit about what we do because I think we are relatively new. Not many people know who we are, but we, we, we support in a variety of ways to the people that are um, referred to us. And the majority of our referrals actually come directly from midwives and from, from other um, parts of the health service. So we run um, various projects we support with, in terms of one-to-one -one companionship. So we support people with advocacy information and emotional support during that perinatal period and we attend births for people who don't have a, a birth companion or a, a friend to attend with them. Uh, we also run uh, antenatal education that's really tailored to the kind of client group that we support. It's very different to the kind of antenatal classes that the NHS runs because it's very, very tailored to our, our people that we support. So we'll have interpreter provision and we provide food and there's flexibility and sometimes childcare where, where possible. So very much kind of tailored to what people need. We also run a peer support programme, which is essentially a weekly mother and baby group. But within that, we also do, we run a range of different workshops and uh, kind of informal education for the people that we support. We also run things like a seasonal gardening group, which, as you can imagine, the summer in Glasgow has been uh, interesting. We've had lots of uh, uh, rain jackets required for the little ones. Um, but there's a, there's a whole kind of range of, you know, that, that again, that idea of community that's really, in terms of health creation, I think that project particularly for us is really where that sits. Um, and we're also increasingly involved in, in influencing and around strategic advocacy because we, well, we, we're not setting out to prove that racialised health inequalities exist. We know that there's an abundance of data, but we've got a really unique, unique insight in terms of the way that we support people to see what's actually happening and try to influence on a, a local and national level. Um, 
I was thinking a wee bit about this concept of health creation because, to be honest, it's not necessarily the way we view... We are probably still framing things in the negative at AMA because there, it feels like there's a lot, to, a lot to convey there. But when I was preparing for this, I was thinking... I was reminded of a TEDx event in Glasgow that I went to a decade ago, unbelievably, eh, where Professor Harry Burns was talking about the, you know, the Glasgow effect and the difference between um, West and East, which I'm sure lots of people will be familiar with. And his, what took him from being a surgeon in Glasgow into public health, and he, I remember he told a story about seeing that, you know, observing that people in the east end of Glasgow heal more slowly from, from wounds than, than they do in other parts of the city, which is incredible. I was also reminded recently that another speaker at that same TEDx event was Dr Catherine Trebek, who I think was at the time was with Oxfam Scotland. There's lots of knowing nods. Um, and she was talking about that idea of, of how this concept of wealth has really kind of been corrupted in terms of the language around it and is obviously now so focused on GDP, but really what we should be thinking more about is, is the, you know, the kind of wider, wider factors around that and, and what, um, you know, what a, a, good, a good society actually means. And so much of this resonates really um, with, with the kind of work that we do at AMA. We're not just interested in that very kind of narrow experience in the hospital of, of you know, birth, childbirth. There's so much more around that. We're interested in, in who people are and um, you know, making sure that we're working in a way that's, that's safe for them in terms of their own culture and language. But also, and we touched on, um, in fact, we were chatting earlier about um, lived expertise and the importance of that. We, we say lived expertise rather than lived experience because I think that really for us that's what it is. Um, but yeah, I'm really looking forward to, to learning more from the panellists. This is, a, I'm sure this will be a really interesting discussion. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Marie. Thank you very much. OK, Peter, I'll come right to you. Thanks very much. And thanks for the invitation to come along and join the discussion this morning. I think before... I start my comments and need to just briefly reflect or mention the new drug death statistics that came out this morning. Um, that should really give us pause and give us focus for our discussion here this morning. Um, the figures are back up, um, 16 times more likely to um, die of a drug, uh, drugs related death uh, if you come from a disadvantaged community than if not. That That's We'll probably talk a lot about statistics this morning and mention some of them. Uh, and as Tajesh has already said, they're quite grim. That is perhaps the most grim one that we might alight upon this morning. Um, when, like Marie, when, when I was invited along here this morning, I thought, well, what are health creators? That's a, that's a bit of a novel concept. Um, and I, I like the positive, hopeful um, emphasis I think, in that notion of, of health creation. And it led me to think more about what, why is it that we, so I work for the, the Poverty Alliance, have done for a long time, why is it that we care about poverty in Scotland? What is it that motivates organisations to join our network? What is it that motivates individuals to take action who are part of our network? Um, and I think it's the sense of, not only the sense of, but the experience of injustice that poverty represents. And I think there's no clearer illustration of that injustice that exists in our society than the persistence of wide health inequalities uh, and the, the, the quite awful outcomes, some that I've just mentioned, that still exist in our society. Um, and as I said, Tajesh has, has said the statistics aren't great, they, aren't, um, they don't make for happy reading. Um, we know that the gap in life expectancy for men um, between the, the most disadvantaged and the least is 14 years in Scotland. Um, healthy life expectancy, which I think almost is in some ways a more telling statistic in terms of our inequalities, um, just, over, just under 45 years for men in our most disadvantaged communities, um, just over 47 years for women in our most disadvantaged communities. Those are, those are really stark statistics. And I think if we'd had this discussion 25 years ago when the parliament was new and just been founded, we might have had a, a slightly um, different outlook. We, we might have had an opportunity to have a discussion about health creators in a, in a different context. We had a new parliament, we had a new opportunity, but we also had a context where um, <coughs> Whilst the gap hadn't narrowed, what we were seeing was life expectancy 
generally still continuing to increase across all groups. Um, so that social gradient was there, it's already been mentioned, but at the very least, um, life expectancy was increasing. And we know even that really um, most important measure is not improving anymore. In fact, we've, we've seen a reversal in life expectancy for the poorest men. We've seen uh, a stall in life expectancy since 2010. And I have no doubt that we will get into some of the discussion about why that's been the case uh, since that period. Um, but when we look across a range of health outcomes in Scotland, almost um, there is a very, very clear pattern that they are worse for people living on low incomes, whether it's suicide, whether it's drug deaths, whether it's even road traffic accidents or uh, industrial injuries, and of course mental health, we know that the outcomes um, are significantly worse. So I mentioned our network, the Poverty Alliance is a, is a large network, around almost 500 members across Scotland. Um, we have grassroots community organisations, we have large NGOs, we have public sector organisations uh, in our membership. And we see those negative health outcomes reflected across all of the work that that diverse network does. And I think particularly over the last few years and particularly uh, since uh, the pandemic, we've seen an increase in concern around mental health and an increasing um, representation uh, by, our, by our member organisations and particularly with grassroots community organisations uh, around issues of, of mental ill health and the impact that it has on uh, the people that they're working with, most often in disadvantaged communities, and also on their staff and on their resources and their ability to uh, deliver on the, the work that they're, they're trying to do. And I think, I think when I look at our, um, that diverse network of grassroots community organisations, what I see is health creators. What I see is organisations that are providing the basis of what a preventative approach to healthcare might look like. And again, we can, we can go into this in the discussion later. Um, when we think about what prevention means, I think we often look to um, the big policy interventions, and they are absolutely needed, and that's absolutely something that the, the Poverty Alliance uh, talks about and lobbies on, and I'll say more about later. But I think prevention and health creation has its roots, for me, in those grassroots organisations, those that are providing um, the care and support that people who are living in the most disadvantaged communities in Scotland need. Um, they provide not only that support, but they also provide hope. And I think that's one of the things that hopefully we can do from our discussion today is to identify those sources of hope and how we magnify them and build on them. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you, Peter. Um, Danny, your Thanks turn. very much, Emma. Uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Danny Boyle. I'm the Parliamentary and Policy Officer with BMIS. Very briefly on BMIS, BMIS are a National Race Equality Intermediate Partnership with the Scottish Government uh, in order to advance race equality issues in Scotland. We're a national membership organisation, so I think it's important for you to be aware of where the information uh, that we gleam where it originates from. So our membership come from ethnic minority communities in Scotland, recognised and protected on the provisions of colour, nationality, ethnic or national origin. Some of those are multi-generational communities, Pakistani, Chinese, Indians, some of them are newer migrants, African communities, uh, Polish, Roma. So it's, it's a complex mix and that's what informs our, our response. We advocate with them to challenge issues which directly affect them. Um, <clears throat> Tejesh uh, mentioned in his introductory comments around about a quarter of children in Scotland live in poverty. Uh, when we apply that lens to ethnic minority communities, that number increases to anywhere between 45 to 51 per cent. So we're beginning to see the significant detrimental impacts of multiple years of austerity. And I think from our perspective uh, and what we hear directly, continuously from those with lived expertise and, and experience uh, is that austerity, and it's important to place this in the room to have an informed discussion, or austerity and racism are health destructors. Um, and this is the combat which we're continuously involved in on a day-to-day -day basis to try and address. In terms of health creation, um, we see it as being a sort of two-way process. Yes, it's incredibly important, 
that our primary and secondary health care services and our health and social care is aware of the complex myriad of issues which affect different ethnic groups, examples of that being sickle cell within African Caribbean black groups, uh, diabetes within the Asian population, and then more nuanced issues such as the disproportionate number of Polish male suicides in Scotland in comparison uh, to the Scottish male population, but also in comparison to the Polish population in Poland. Uh, and what that shows up is nuanced experiences of migrants in Scotland are an experience of engaging with uh, a socio and economic system which is hostile to migrants. And even more nuanced things around about the Scottish Health, uh, Ethnicity and Linkages Survey found in 2017. This may come as a surprise to some people, but those of Irish ethnicity in Scotland are seven times more likely to die of alcohol-related illness. So these are, these, this is a sort of myriad, some very prominent, obvious things which I think the NHS is informed of and responds to and some more nuanced things which we work with member organisations and, and colleagues to try and address and, uh, and push forward on. So that's a bit about health care in, uh, in terms of a service provision. Health creation, in its much more broadest sense, uh, is about how we construct ourselves as a society, mm -hmm. uh, how we engage with each other, uh, and that's why I'll return to the issue around about austerity and racism uh, being health destructors across a whole number of areas and issues which eventually, when they play out, place significant pressure with on uh, our healthcare system. And to give an example of that, it's how we, um, you know, how communities which we support have to operate in. So they have to operate in, many of them, asylum seekers, uh, as, as, as my colleague identified, in a hostile environment. It's intentionally called a hostile environment. This creates significant uh, both mental and physical health trauma for individuals, which eventually plays out in terms of the NHS and, and their capacity to respond to that. So that's about decision-making at a UK government level, it's the decision-making at local government level, and it's the decision-making at Scottish government level. Uh, and just my final point on that, in terms of understanding health creation in the most holistic way within the context of austerity and racism, uh, the last couple of weeks we've had an absolutely diabolical upsurge uh, in, in racist rhetoric and racist... Uh, you know, protests and anti-immigration sentiment, uh, which again places a significant mental health impact and physical if you're attacked or you're, 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 you're a target of that with on ethnic minority communities. And uh, we were devastated um, to learn yesterday that the Scottish Government had in fact pulled the pilot scheme um, for free bus travel for asylum seekers within Scotland. The one smidgen of light we had potentially for one of the most marginalised groups, many of whom live on less than £2 per day, uh, a policy cost of £2 million, which in relative terms to the Scottish Government's budget is practically nothing, uh, has been pulled. So when we're talking about health creation, it comes from UK Government level, it comes from Scottish Government level, it obviously comes from an informed NHS, but when budgetary decisions are being made, they have to take into account the wider ripple effect impacts on racialised communities. Um, so that's what we're here to discuss, uh, tackling austerity, tackling racism, taking a holistic approach uh, and we're in a very challenging period coming ahead and it's going to be incredibly important that we collaborate together and have discussions like this. Good, thank you. Thank you, Danny. Okay. Um, Wendy, final, final opening from you. How do I follow that? <laughs> I mean, for goodness sake, you know, I've just heard four speakers that inspire me and make me feel passionate. So I think I'm going to come across as very, very boring. So I apologise in advance. And if my hairdresser was watching, she was saying, and it's time you had a haircut. <laughs> there we go. So who am I? I'm His Majesty's uh, Chief Inspector of Prisons Scotland. And prisons are unique. And that, why are they unique? It's because they're hidden. Most of us have not been in a prison. I've been in rather too many. <laughs> and most of us haven't a clue what goes on in a prison, haven't a clue what happens. But for the very small number of people in prison, and at the moment it's quite a large number for Scotland, it's just over 8,000, it is a fact of life. And what happens in prison is a direct impact on what happens on the families too. When someone goes into prison, they are punished. They lose their livelihood. They lose their freedom. That deprivation of liberty is huge. I think for me, I would miss not being able to have frequent cups of coffee, but it's a side issue. But there's the other side, um, where what happens to them in prison, because everything happens to people in prison. They have very, very little responsibility and empowerment. 
And unfortunately, that ripples out to their families. Quite often, the, per the person going into prison forces that family into deprivation and poverty. And until we can tackle poverty and deprivation in the community before people go into prison, we're not going to be able to cope with the health inequalities of people in prison. That's my expertise, so I'll stick to that. But I also think, for me, that it's really important to look at where we've come from and celebrate of what we've achieved. And yesterday I was speaking to a group of people who are the lead people for collaborative health care in prison. Really interesting group of people. But there was absolutely no recognition of how much we've actually achieved. And if I look at a recent example of COVID, so Michelle Batelet, who was the head of the United Nations, was saying that she expected in Britain 6,000 people to die of COVID while in custody because it was such a contained environment with very little fresh air. Well, in Scotland, 10. And while 10 is a tragedy for every single member of their family, 10 is not 600. And I think we need to celebrate sometimes. I look backwards in prisons. We used to chain mentally ill people to the wall and brand them. And how that's supposed to make them better, I'll never know. But there we go. We used to send children up chimneys and the child mortality rate was very, very, very high. We've got rid of all of that. And I think it is time to take that next leap forward. So for me, I think... We do talk about where, we don't talk about where we've come from or what's been successful, but I like the getting it right for every child. There used to be 500 children in prison, and recently, 2006-ish, and it's now 2024, and by the end of next week, there will not be a child in prison at all. No matter how heinous the crime, they will go into a therapeutic environment why do I think that's important? Why do I think they need a massive amount of assessment and therapy and support? Because when they come out of prison, I don't want another victim. And at the moment, prisons cannot provide that therapeutic, wonderful support. They are providing it in the very small segment of women's population. Now, the largest women's prison is not the purpose-built, designed, wonderful women's prisons. But the ones they have built, Sterling and the two community custody units, are wonderful. And I think when we evaluate treating people therapeutically, treating them with respect, helping them cope with what all the reasons that brought them into prison in the first place, I think we will see that they go out safer, responsible citizens. And therefore, we'll be able to learn the lessons from that and apply it to men. So... One of my passionate things about health in prison is we ignore the ripple effect. So people who come into prison tend to have more complex needs. They age much faster. They die younger. Um, and interestingly, at the other end, when you look at children, they take a long time to come to adulthood in terms of brain maturation. But I never forget going into Barlini prison, and they have an aged care unit there, daycare. And I was chatting to the men there who were, you know, losing their teeth, thinning hair, liver spots, and a bit shaky, Zimmer frames, all of these things. And one of them was saying, it's wrong that I have to sleep on a top bunk because, you know, I have to go to the loo three times a night and it's really difficult and I'm not very mobile. And I'm thinking, yeah, 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 52. Not 74, 52. I was a bit shocked. I thought, God, I'm older than you. Anyway, <laughs> for me, we need to look at prison health care. And I let me give a little case study. So I ran a, a young offenders prison, 18 to 25, and I was determined that we would beat the statistics. And it was in Australia. And the statistics were, if they were Aboriginal, they were 75% of them were going to return to prison within two years. And I thought, nah, nah, we can change that round. <laughs> and we did. We dropped it to 28%, which isn't good, but it's a heck of a lot better than 75%. And one of the things we did was concentrate on health. So we had expert patients. What's an expert patient? It's people who live with long-term conditions and who know it well. 
They ran the well-man clinics. You're diabetic, you go and talk to another prisoner. You're living with obesity, let's work about prison to do. And let me give a little case study. So we had a little man called Kurt, and he came in, and he was hundreds of kilos, basically he was 32 stone. He was 19 years of age, and when his family came to visit, they were equally round. He was extremely unhealthy and at risk of dying very young. And the healthcare team sat down with him, as did a few other prisoners, including one who'd lost a lot of weight and was now a lean, mean, you know, buns of steel type person. And, uh, and said, we can turn your life around. We can make you feel good about yourself. To cut a long story short, they worked intensively with him. And he came down to a lean, mean person. It was just amazing watching that happen and just what is visibly happening. What was visibly happening was his self-esteem was going up. But he learned to cook. He learned to eat healthily. He learned to budget. He learned a skill, plastering. And he learned business skills. And when he went out, he set up a plastering firm. And the first people he employed were his family. And the second thing he did was the minute he had some income was he bought a cooker to put in the family house and taught them to cook. And he came back to visit me a year and a half later, now running a very successful plastering business, a lot of ex-offenders, brought his family with him, and they were all much healthier and beaming with self-esteem. And it's that ripple effect. If we deal with the health that we meet in prison, and many of them have never been to a GP or rarely been to a GP, the only time they see a doctor is in an emergency, we deal with that health in prison, we will turn those people's lives around. More to the point, we will turn their families around. around. We may even turn their community around. And that, for me, is why health inequalities and tackling poverty and deprivation at the early stage is what we need all to do. Good. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. That's uh, lots of, um, well, lots of notes for me even and thoughts. And, and uh, one of the things that I remember from uh, Harry Burns using the word flourish, and he wanted to see our wains flourish. And I liked the image that that created because, you know, and that's kind of links to the um, water in the grass uh, rather than just the grass is green on the other side. So if you water the grass, you'll see your wings flourish as well. So, uh, so I, I quite like that. So we're going to kick off with some questions, right? Um, because I'm chairing, I get to go first. <laughs> and, uh, and what we'll do is uh, um, I might just r run with like two or three questions and then we'll come to, I suppose, whoever wants to answer first, and you don't necessarily have to answer every question, but uh, just to get the ball rolling, I'm interested to, um, one of our pre-written questions is, is it the job of the NHS to prevent ill health, or is that a job of wider society? And then how does that link with what we're thinking about value in the third sector in being partners? with our National Health Service um, in focusing on prevention and uh, dealing with poverty, dealing with health inequalities and all of that. So um, who wants to go first with, uh, with that question? I'll go. Peter? Why? Peter, okay. Um, and I'll take the... Is it an easy question? I think it possibly is an easy question. Is it the job of the NHS to prevent health inequalities? Um, they certainly have an enormous role. And really, the, the, I think it was really interesting when they talked about you know, reminding ourselves uh, what we have achieved. And I think when we look at the NHS, even in, with, with all the criticisms that can rightly be uh, laid at the door of the NHS at the moment, um, it is an incredible achievement and it has played a really important role in addressing health inequalities. But if we are to um, go further and to really close the gap that, that we've seen, then I, I don't believe that the NHS is the means by which to do that. It's an important, vitally important part of the picture. Um, but some of what, what I mentioned earlier about the role of, um, of communities and, and thinking about health in a in a much wider context, we've already had reference to uh, 
the idea of a well-being economy. I think when we place health in that much wider context about what, what role does our economy play, what role do uh, the systems and structures beyond our NHS play in either um, undermining uh, people's health and promoting health inequalities or addressing them. Um, so I think we can ask a lot of the NHS, but similarly, if we think about um, educational attainment gaps, how do, we, how do we address those? Is it by focusing all the attention on the experience in schools? Well, yes. I mean, a lot of, a lot of the solution to educational attainment gaps um, resides within schools, but we know that the solutions are not within those schools. It's what happens outside those schools, it's what happens to families um, before their children end up in schools. Um, so I think um, we will no doubt talk more about the role of the third sector. That's obviously something that many of us on this panel um, are deeply involved in and feel passionately about. But I think unless we, as, again as Wendy said, unless we start to fix some of those structures that surround the NHS, that, um, that actually lead to people turning up on the, the door of the NHS, then um, we won't fix uh, health inequalities and we certainly won't um, get the best out of our NHS either. Okay, thanks. I think Danny wants to come in and then we'll come to Tejish. <coughs> yeah, thanks very much. Um, just before I answer the question, just in terms of the NHS and, and uh, race, race equality and, and celebrating the fact of the positive impact of ethnic minority communities have in Scotland, there is no primary or secondary health care in Scotland without immigration. Um, so, you know, we, we have this permanent uh, negative narrative emanating from a number of sources around about migrants take this and asylum seekers take this, when in actual fact, the actual reality is this without inward migration to Scotland, even over the last census period of 2011 to 2022, our public services would be crippled. OK, so that's incredibly important narrative, which has to be shared much more broadly. Um, and I've spoke about, you know, the, the importance of the NHS being informed. But in terms of that broader health creation and, and holistic uh, you, you, you know, approach, um, there is a multitude of policy areas which are absolutely and utterly critical uh, to, to preventative, uh, or the creation of pre preventative or responding to, strategically responding to preventative health care. Um, we have talked about a little bit about education and personal agency. And one thing which I would like to, to highlight is the role of the arts and culture uh, and what we would refer to in sort of geeky policy terms as, as an intangible cultural heritage. And what we mean by intangible cultural heritage is all of the diverse citizens of Scotland that we equally value and recognise and create strategic opportunities to celebrate them individually as intrinsic people uh, and their communities. So I'm talking about their languages, their migration stories, their food, their music, their perspectives, their social, economic, religious identities, all of these things which define people and define communities. And it's massively, massively important that we find a way that they are able to experience inclusion in Scotland in a way which develops community resilience to issues which we've seen emanating over the, over the last couple of weeks and the individual experiences of racism which people face on a day-to-day -day basis in Scotland. And one of the ways we used to address this before another impact of austerity uh, was to look at what, what's the most important parts of Scotland's cultural calendar. What are dates which we can all chip in and get behind and define for ourselves as different ethnic groups, as different diverse communities, as cities, as regions? And it was around about the Scottish Winter Festival period, around about St Andrew's Day, around about Burns Night, and around about other cultural celebrations, uh, Deshera, Hanukkah, which fell within this period. And we used to have uh, a small grants programme um, which essentially we, we asked ethnic minority communities and others across Scotland is celebrate these national days, uh, but it, celebrate, them, celebrate it using your intangible cultural heritage so that Scotland's national days and national identity becomes more inclusive and more representative and more reflective uh, of Scotland's diverse population. And why is that related to health? It's related to health because it creates a sense of home within our communities it creates a sense of recognition, it creates a sense of collective ownership, and it develops shared memories. Um, so some of these were, were as simple as, uh, you know, taking the national poet of Pakistan and obviously our own, Rabbi Burns, and holding uh, cultural events around about Burns Night and bringing different communities together. And other of them were much 
larger national events like the annual Celtic Connections concert we used to do, where we'd bring different cultural elements from across Scotland and ensure that the communities had ownership of programming that and participating within it. So health creation is everything that we do within a society to create solid bonds between each other and make people feel safe and welcome and included and respected and have opportunities to express themselves. And that's, you know, I'm sorry that I keep going back to this issue of austerity, but all of this, our, our capacity to do that is predicated on investment. Mm -hmm. And we don't have that investment at the moment. So we have to think really, really cleverly and strategically about how we reset up those infrastructures within the circumstances with which we face. OK, thanks. Tejish, did you want to come in? Yeah, gosh, my, my mind's blown. There's so many points there that Dan has picked up on that I'd like to kind of elaborate on. But I think um, the things that are kind of really key to me are, I feel there's, there's a real sweet spot here where it's, it's not the NHS by itself. It's not just the third sector. There's a, there's a point where those two come together and that can be really powerful in terms of reaching people. It's this idea of equity, and we've heard a bit about some of the kind of specialisms, the focus on certain communities um, where we have that knowledge, where we can actually work with people in terms of their lived experiences and really understanding uh, what works for them that the third sector brings a real strength in. Um, uh, I have an example where I worked for a charity and we, we launched a new, what we called an outdoor therapy service, so a walk and talk um, counselling service to complement um, the NHS um, CAMS uh, mental health services um, that were available. Um, and this was targeted at people that would just would not engage with a normal going into a clinical environment and sitting what we used to call the kind of two chairs and a pot plant environment uh, indoors. They, they would just wouldn't go. So this enabled those people to access support and therapy that they would not normally uh, even think about engaging with. And that can be really powerful. Um, so I think that, that there's a lot there that we need to consider. That, that the risk is that the third sector services are being depleted, unfortunately, uh, during this, this period of austerity. Um, uh, there's uh, currently a reliance, particularly from the public sector, on that existing infrastructure as though it's a given. Um, and unfortunately, that's, that, that's not necessarily the case. Um, I'm involved in conversations about how the police um, deal with distress and mental health calls at the moment. And they have a significant reliance upon the third sector supporting those referrals. Um, but there's no guarantee that will be there for the future. Um, and I will say, you know, the third sector provides such a mix of opportunities um, for those activities on the ground. Everything's from, from med sh men's sheds to the cultural activities that, that Danny's talked about. Um, and there's something for everybody within that. OK, all right, thank you. I think, um, Marie, you wanted to add something. Yeah, I guess thinking about those two questions that you asked together, I think if we were to design a national health service now, it would absolutely have a focus on health creation and health, and, you know, the prevention of ill health. But I think we do have the system, of a system that's been around for many decades. And it's also experienced many, you know, decades of underfunding as well. And I think that's, you know, part of the the challenging situation that we find ourselves in. So I agree with what others have said already, that it's absolutely about a partnership. And I know that that concept of health creation is really, you know, those kind of relationships between individuals and communities and the NHS and, and other organisations, including third sector, is really an important part of that concept of, um, of health creation. I think, it's, I think we would all agree that the, the third sector has an absolutely enormous contribution to health and social care, um, both on the... Um, health creation side, but also on mitigating some of the effects of austerity and of the, you know, some of the, the, the challenging structures that we do have. And I was just thinking as others were talking there, I think it's, it's worth noting, it's certainly important for us at AMA, and I'm sure it is to lots of our organisations and to many in the sector, that the contribution of volunteers within the third sector to health and wellbeing and indeed um, health creation, I think is absolutely enormous. It's, it's huge, it's hard to, to quantify. And I think it's really interesting putting that health creation lens over that because I think one of the things that probably draws lots of, um, of people into to volunteering is the idea that they can contribute to the health and well-being of, of um, people in their communities. But there's also a really important well-being aspect of volunteering as well that I think is really important in terms of creating healthy societies and, and people that feel really connected and, and part of a community. Thanks. Um, Wendy, I'm going to come to you with a quick question around well-being and well-being in prisons. Um, I have visited uh, HMP Dumfries on a number of occasions and they have family well-being uh, 
movie nights and different things that they are. Uh, they've got a wonderful garden and uh, and uh, they have solar panels in the in the the space that's outside um, the prison to power electricity uh, for the for the prison. And so there's a lot of work going on. But in terms of NHS now looking after our NHS workforce within the prison to look at healthcare. Do you think there has been a valuable connection now created in looking at how we support therapeutic environments within prison in order to help support um, uh, processes so that offenders don't re-offend? I wish I could say yes. <laughs> So half of me says I admire the people who work in prison because they do a phenomenal job. And the other half of me such, sees such a level of health inequality that I at times despair. The man who's got stage four cancer and prison transport cancel his appointments four times in a row. And then the health care provider arranging the appointment assumes that he's not interested and they take him off the waiting list. Now, all the health boards have been advised that it's not that person's fault. But I think about when we have something like cancer and we have an appointment, you know, if, if necessary, we can call for help, we can get a taxi, we can get a bus, we can walk, we can ask a friend, we can advise that we can't make it ourselves, we can get an ambulance. Prisoners can't. They don't even know they've got an appointment. They're just sitting there worrying. Quite often in a cell designed for one, sharing it with a total stranger who may not have the same hygiene as them, 22 hours a day, worrying. I just think that's inhumane, actually. And I would love to think that they are developing a therapeutic environment. How can you, when you've got 8,000 people in a prison service that is actually really designed for about 4,500 or 5,000? You can't. How can you, when the prison transport provider cannot recruit enough staff to be able to manage the escorts to prison. It just isn't possible. They don't have the ability to ring 111 that we do when we're worried in the middle of the night. They may have run out of phone credit. They may be feeling suicidal, but they can't phone anyone because they've run out of phone credit. We have a system whereby we pay a monthly amount and we get as many phone calls as we want. If you're on remand in Scotland, you may not get paid at all any money whatsoever. You get 200 free minutes in a month. And if you're well, you can manage those 200 minutes to make sure you phone all your loved ones and do all your stuff. If you're not well, you won't be able to and you'll run out of money. And it could be at a crucial time for you. We also don't manage mentally ill people very well. There are big delays. They have reduced, but they are still there between people who are deemed to require inpatient treatment, but there isn't a bed. And so they stay in prison. And you see their health deteriorating. And when they are psychotic or having psychotic episodes, they have to be kept away from the rest of the population. And they're placed in segregation. And the number of people I see mentally unwell in segregation showing deep distress is really shocking. And I hope that in 50 years' time, this country will look back at that and say, oh, my goodness, that's as bad as sending children up the chimneys. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, I don't see it as therapeutic. Now, let me put some positives on here. If you were to go to the new women's prison and the new community custody units, you would be delighted. In fact, I'd like to retire there. They're so nice. <laughs> but, and the wee prisons, Dumfries, Greenock, Inverness, they are wonderful because they've got really strong prisoner staff relationships and because they're tiny and they're crumbly and they're falling to bits they're just really making an effort to kind of work a way round all the problems and inadequacies you talk to the prisoners in there and say hey you can go to a wonderful new prison in Aberdeen you know in cell in cell shower and toilet and it's all light and airy and lovely and they go no thanks I like where I am and it's the staff-prisoner relationships. Mm -hmm. The other thing that stands out in prison in terms of health care is that you've got nine different health boards providing health care. So you move from one prison to where you're very happy, you like the GP, you like the staff, you feel you're doing well, you move to another prison, they don't have the same drug regime and they take you <coughs> off the drugs that you felt happy with and put you on different ones. 
the amount of complaints we get around that is absolutely enormous. Now, to be fair, I raised a lot of issues with healthcare, like technology. I mean, they should have healthcare anywhere. You know, they should be able to do phone somebody in a cell and say, are you okay? You know, how are you getting on? I saw you yesterday. You can't do any of that at the moment. So, you know, I did raise a lot of this and they have done such a lot to drive healthcare forward in prisons. It's really quite inspirational. But the straight reality is they have difficulty recruiting staff. They've got too many people and too little resources to be able to cope. Okay, thanks. Right, I am conscious that... Uh we might have some audience members that want to ask some questions. And there is a roving mic. And so what I would ask you to do, if anybody has any questions, put your hand up. Keep your hand up until the microphone comes to you. It's, we're using the microphone so that it's, it's contained within the recording. And then I might take two or three questions at a time just so that we have the chance to process the information that's put forward. So... Anybody got a question? Yeah, okay. There's a lady at the front here, fourth row back. Hi there, thank you. That was really, really interesting. Um, this question sort of plays into the first question that was asked, and I think we've seen over the last few weeks how badly misinformation can impact societies, and we saw throughout COVID as well the impact this was having on people and their trust in the health systems around them. So I'd like to hear the panel's thoughts about how they think health misinformation plays into and how it impacts different health creators. Okay, health misinformation. Is there anybody else on that side got a question so that our microphone person doesn't have to run around the room? <laughs> well, we'll go with that one first. Okay, just think about like misinformation and uh, and what's been happening recently. I see Danny nodding his head that he wants to come in. It, one of the things <laughs> I, I was an economic migrant when I moved from Scotland to work in California, and it was a whole different culture. And I was told every day to speak English, and uh, so it was a real. It, it could be a challenging environment. I thought I was speaking English, so I had a lot of <laughs> learning experience when I went to California for 14 years, working in a melting pot of multicultural and it was in the most amazing experience of my life so um, so that was just interesting for me but health misinformation Danny yeah, yeah thanks it's a, an incredibly important question and it's becoming more and more of a, a danger uh, and a challenge uh, in society as, as, as the use of uh, the internet and encrypted um, messaging uh, takes has an impact in places I'll maybe say something about the riots um, because it's pertinent in, in a minute or so, but just to give an example directly in relation to health and a solution we found in quite a rapid period with regards to it, again, and it re-emphasises the importance of partnership in the third sector. During the uh, pandemic, um, there was a whole number of racialised health inequalities which, which were exacerbated by the impact of the pandemic, social, economic, cultural, social isolation. But one which really came uh, was so important because it was a, a national health issue was vaccination uptake. Um, so what we had, I think the first vaccination was late December 2020, it could have been. Um, but anyway, from the, from the period of the first vaccination being taken, and this again relates to the issue of structural racism in terms of, of, of how we administer services, um, there was a decision taken uh, by the Vaccination and Advisory Board, I might have got the acronym wrong, but I think you all know who I'm talking about at the time, not to collect ethnicity data at a point of vaccination. Um, so obviously our position at that time was, well, that's deeply unhelpful because what we've seen throughout the pandemic thus far is differentiations for different ethnic groups. And we really need to understand if different groups aren't coming forward for vaccination because we need to respond to it. And we sort of put out a flash survey of our membership. Uh, and at that time, we had, we had set up very specifically what was called the Ethnic Minority National Resilience Network. And I can see some members from the Polish community here this morning who were hugely beneficial and crucial in responding to this issue. Um, we put, put that ca canvassed our members on what could be barriers to vaccinations within your different ethnic groups. And a lot of intelligence came back. Um, African, Caribbean and black groups were concerned that vaccination um, testing had not been adequately inclusive of people from their communities and as such would there be disproportionate side effects 
Um, it was also a fact that you know, we had three or four different vaccines. Uh, and again, an analysis of that community and what was fed back to us was that they're using different vaccines on white people and black people. Okay, so these, these, are, these, are, these are hubs of concern which can permeate quite rapidly within different groups due to you know, use of social media and algorithms and such as that. And we saw other yeah, you know, instances, concerns, anti, anti, a general anti-vax um, narrative emanating from countries of origin, particularly uh, Poland was one particular country, and that was put down to more uh, potentially conservative religious values and th what's contained within particular vaccines. So that, that's what was emanating within particular different ethnic groups. And what we also were aware of at the time, uh, and this is, we see this across a whole d different types of geopolitical situations, and we've seen the last couple of weeks, is hostile, um, hostile characters who are very interested in, in sowing societal division within different countries. Uh, and, and obviously knowing how to touch uh, pressure points within different groups in order to share false information, which re re ends up with some of the you know, significant societal issues we've seen over the last couple of weeks. So what was our solution to misinformation around about vaccinations at that real and in, in, in real time? And it was to invest directly into the third sector community organisations to have informed vaccinate. We called it the Vaccination Information Fund. So essentially, not to demand that people take a vaccination, but ensure that they accessed informed information around about it. And that meant that we invested around about £78,000, not a huge amount of money in the grand scheme of things, to specific community organisations. So they had their own safe places to discuss vaccination. They were inviting in, because we had developed links with different scientific teams who had developed the vaccines. They were inviting them in to have one-to-one -one conversations. They were having conversations in in mother tongues, and they were just discussing things which were relevant to them. So what we saw as an outcome of that was the vaccination uptake at the first, between the first and second dose of vaccination uh, increased from 34% uptake within African, Caribbean and black groups over the six months period of uh, March until August, increased from 34 to 68%, um, which was a, you know, a, a, a huge win at that time. Um, but that sort of permanent vigilance to connecting with communities is required across uh, the implementation of health and social care so, <clears throat> or in, in vaccination campaigns. So we saw that in real time at that particular point that misinformation and spreading was, was a threat to health for them as individuals and for society more broadly. And we see that replicating across other pressure points around about anti-immigration, around about racism, around about complete, just completely made up information which, which has significant impacts in, in terms of community cohesion and that's something BEMIS as an organisation and our network are permanently uh, vigilant to and, and trying to respond to. I think, um, Marie, you wanted to come in as well and, the, and Wendy as well. Yeah, just briefly, just to pick up on what you were you were saying there, Danny. I think that's really interesting, and it just reminded me of um, specifically in relation to the pandemic, and maybe where some of the kind of origins of those, you know, maybe how things are able to kind of take hold in certain communities. And I think that issue of trust is such a huge thing. But I think quite often the lack of trust is actually there are some real reasons behind the, the, the you know the fact that there might be a lack of trust. And as you've touched on already, so much of that comes back to institutional and systemic racism and I was thinking specifically in relation to the pandemic you know we learned too late that um, blood oximeters weren't working effectively on black and brown skin which was having you know really significant impacts during the pandemic when we were so reliant on them um, in primary care and I was also then thinking about the, how that maybe feeds through to, to some of the inequalities that we see in perinatal um, services as well um, I was one really interesting thing is around um, you know how things present on different skin tones, and I think we're to be still kind of having to deal with the, this kind of question, given given the you know how diverse a population we now have, and particularly in Glasgow, um, it, it's amazing that we're having to push back on some of these things when really we should have moved so far beyond this. So, for example, certain things not picked up sufficiently in babies with black and brown skin and I think that the APGAR scores that are, are still used and I think there's some questions around their efficacy anyway but certainly mm -hmm. in terms of what they actually will pick up on on different skin tones I think there, there's some really so yeah I guess it's not necessarily about misinformation necessarily but maybe about how, how some of those things can take hold I think that issue of trust is is a really huge thing. That's interesting I used to be a clinical nurse educator and as 
we evolved doing cardiopulmonary resuscitation, the mannequins that we practised on, their skin tone has changed over the years. And starting an IV, we now have brown arms to um, start IVs on now. So it's taken a long time for that to evolve, but uh, that is a, a practice now that's uh, interesting in healthcare. So. I think, uh, Wendy, did you want to talk about... Yeah, I was going to Ms. talk about that issue of trust and respect. And, and yes, I think we all know somebody who's been not well treated or whatever. But um, for me, health misinformation is a really interesting one because 99.9% .9 of us believe that the NHS can cure everything. Mm -hmm. Unless we have personal experience, that means they can't. And, and the other thing is, we all know that the person they make dog walking who's got similar pills to you is a much better expert mm -hmm. than the GP. You know, it's well known. And I think social media plays into that. That lack of respect for someone who's done seven years training, goes on training every year, whether they're a nurse or a doctor, the lack of respect we have for them because it is always overshadowed by what we read on Google, what we get from our next door neighbours. That, that for me is a very worrying trend. And when you link that to a belief that actually the NHS should be able to sort out everything. You know, if you smoke 90 a day and you're 22 stone and you take no exercise, it's not your fault you're ill. Absolutely not. And it's certainly nothing to do with losing weight, eating healthily or taking exercise. But actually, and it comes back to your previous question, is it all the NHS's responsibility? No, it's all our responsibility. But they are the people who hold the expertise at a very senior level. And they are the people that have to guide us and help us and move forward. And I think early intervention is critical I was working for a while in Australia with um, a healthcare unit that worked with very obese children um, because very, very obese children suffer in many, so many ways, not just healthily wise. And what was really interesting, they wouldn't take anybody until they were 100% over their healthy weight. So if they were supposed to be four stone, they wouldn't take them till they were eight stone when in fact the problems start occurring when they start getting overweight, you know? And actually that early intervention of saying, I think there's a bit of a problem, we can help you, let's sort that out, is critical to a healthy nation. But we don't have the resources to do that. And we don't have the belief and the trust and the respect in our NHS to do it. I mean, it was lovely that we clapped for them, but how many of us volunteered to actually go and work in the hospital? <laughs> it is interesting. Anyway, enough of me, sorry. Thank you. So we've got one question here um, in front, and then another one and another one, right? So can we do three front row questions? We'll do, is it, if, are you guys okay with that? We'll do three questions soon and then see where we go. Thank you, Emma, and thanks to the panel. That's been a fascinating discussion this morning. My name's Esther Roberton, and I've chaired a couple of health boards. I'm not a medical person at all. But I come back to something you said, Peter, early on about the early days of the Parliament and how optimistic we all were. And at that point, I was chair of NHS Fife and I was also involved in education. And I can remember how upset I was when I heard Gordon Brown had raised a penny on national insurance to put into the health service. Don't get me wrong, Gordon was my MP, really good guy. I remember thinking then, money's actually quite plentiful at the moment, as it was then, before austerity. Why didn't we invest it in housing and education and jobs to help people stay well rather than invest it in a health service that treats us when we're sick? I don't think many people know that the share of the health, sorry, the, the health service budget was 30%, I think, at that point of the Scottish budget. It's now 40 something and it's heading for half. And what we've done is we've poured money into the health service and we've taken it from local government, which means we don't get the housing and the education and all the other services, including the cultural ones. How do we shift? Because I, I disagree in a way, Wendy. I think the public's become so trusting in the health service to, as you say, fix everything, that they forget that there are other things we could do to stop people being sick in the first place. How do we shift that kind of sacred cow mentality away from the NHS is the answer to everything and let's invest what money we do have in the likes of, of the local councils and the third sector, obviously? Okay. 
and we had lady in the front here and then in the second row. Thank you. Um, my name is Charlotte Young. I'm here from the food train. Thanks to the panel for um, it's been a really interesting morning. I wanted to point back to Marie's um, comment earlier about if we were to design the NHS now, it would look very different when it comes to health creation. And hopefully it won't take us too much off track. But I just wanted to point to the fact that we're currently the Scottish Government is looking at the National Care Service. It's going through the second stage um, of consultations. And I wanted to just present that as an opportunity to the panel. If if we were to focus on health creation in the context of the NC NCS, what would you want to see? How, what would you like to see in the design of the NCS to ensure that it can support health creation? Good question. Thank you. I am on health committee and we are taking that bill through at stage two right now. Uh, okay, question three. Okay. I've got notes if anything, um, right? My name's Laura and I work in higher education, focusing on educational inequalities and access to education. But this is a selfish question, really. Um, we're always talking about how partnership's essential to, to kind of improving outcomes for some of the learners that we're working with, um, you know, a joined up approach. And I think maybe, Danny, you talked about the, how important partnership was going to be. And, and in light of some of the cuts that are being discussed and the, the kind of challenging period we're moving into, I'm kind of selfishly interested in what really effective partnership looks like across all of your kinds of organisations, either like things that you, you're doing already in terms of health creation and, and health inequalities or things that you know needs to happen. I'm just, I'm just interested to know what, what really effective partnership actually means and looks like in practice and a practical level. Um, I'm always interested in the actually nitty gritty of how it works like, and, and what it can deliver for, for the kind of communities that you've talked about today. So in any of your, your industries. Okay, so three questions. Um... Uh, how do we shift away from the sacred cow mentality of NHS can fix everything? The second question was, what do we want the National Care Service to look like mm -hmm. as part of health prevention and health creation? And then what does effective partnership mean in practice? Dejesh, will I come to you first? I, I, I can try. I'll, I'll go with the first question, if I may. I'll, I'll try uh, and answer that from my perspective. So um, I guess we've heard examples of how public sector services, particularly we talk about prisons, we talk about hospitals, they're bursting at the seams. Um, we haven't got the capacity to hold those people. So, I mean, the trajectory for a while has been about how can we ensure we support those people within a community setting? And I think that's where a big part of that answer lies. How can we support those people thinking about primary care? Mm -hmm general practice support but also wider within communities and there's obviously a huge role there not just for the third sector but wider civil society and there's a huge number of community organizations volunteering as a kind of key role within that the role that that can play in supporting people within a community and for me that's sort of um, it's, it's a cycle, you know, very much as a preventative action. How can people be um, engaged and supported? But thinking kind of why are they coming out of prison? Um, they're discharged from hospital. What are the interventions and support that they can tap into? Um, and we know that the, the community link worker model um, and social prescribing is quite key within that. And it's quite a kind of constructive way of ensuring that somebody understands what's available they can help capacity build within that and ensure that people can get there so some of that's actually just access and transport and logistics um, behind that as well okay thanks thoughts from others peter um, i'm looking at the clock and thinking how many more opportunities we're going to have to no. to speak here because those were three really fantastic and i think quite linked questions um, and I'm trying to think of something that links them all uh, and actually the, the, the word that keeps popping into my head right throughout from when we started this morning is questions of power uh, and who has it and who doesn't um, and I think it, it does link to, um, to all three of those points Esther you, you uh, mentioned 25 years ago and what Gordon Brown did or didn't do uh, with investment and I, th I think where we have a good example of what he did with investment or what that Labour government did with investment um, and how they changed some priorities from the 1990s as we look at um, the investment that went into social security in some areas but not in all 
uh, that went into Sure Start centres and their um, version in Scotland. And that, I think, whilst you know, the, there is the sacred cow of the, the NHS, and I think it is very difficult to deprioritise that. And whenever any of us engage with the NHS as users, I think we can see both the flaws in the system and the inefficiencies and the, the lack of resource manifest itself. We also see the amazing service that's still provided. We see that, that duality. So I think it's very difficult to think about how do we um, how do we deprioritize the NHS? What we need to think about is how do we raise the, the profile? How do we raise uh, the importance of the third sector? And I think in relation to to the other two points, I'm not going to be able to answer them all, can I? It's, it's too, too big a uh, challenge for myself. But I think the National Care Service, not being particularly close to, to the debate as it's, as it's rolled along and how it's changed, but I think the role of the third sector in the delivery of care in communities is absolutely vital. But I do think, and this is where there's a bit of um, self-critique, I think, of the third sector, is we need to be conscious of the role that we play. And we think of ourselves as the third sector, and we think of ourselves too often, I think, as primarily service providers. I would like to, to encourage those of you who are involved or in volunteering in the, the third sector to start thinking of ourselves as civil society and start to think of ourselves as organisations, as networks, as partnerships that have some power and that have some voice. And at the moment, we rarely use it. We rarely use it effectively. And I think that's something that we need to do more of if we're to, um, if we're to have any opportunity to shift towards the kind of preventative solutions that I think, I'm taking a wild stab in the dark here, that probably most people in this room would think that we need to move to. So a better uh, social security system, more fair work, these are the things that will underpin whether we have a, a um, national care service that's fit for purpose. And I'm going to hold fire on whether that looks likely at the moment in terms of the current state of the development. I'll stop there. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Um, Marie. Yeah, I think I was just having a think there about that third question around effective partnership and, and thinking about that in terms of the way that we work. I mentioned already we're quite a, a young organisation in the grand scheme of things. But we know that, and I haven't really talked about these stats in particular, and I think they, do, they are worth sharing, but we do know, not from, from our data, AMA, but from data that's published every year from the Embrace report, that black women are four times as likely to die during the perinatal period, and Asian women are twice as likely to die, and people from disadvantaged communities are also twice as likely to die during that time. We've known this for many years at AMA, and it's been the reason why, right from the start, it's really kind of baked into the way that we work, that we've been gathering lots of data and observations, very detailed information. And for the past few years, we've been thinking about exactly what to do with that. And I should say as well, we weren't, we, you know, we were gathering that data not to set out to kind of prove anything, because I think it's really well, that those inequalities are really well understood. But we were doing it really in the early days so that we could provide the best possible advocacy and support for the people that we were, we were supporting. What we've had, we've had this kind of question about what to actually do with that as the kind of the data has grown and grown. And we published a, a report earlier this year um, looking at birth outcomes and experiences, particularly of our client group. And the, the, the people that we were looking at within the report were all from racialised groups. Now, it's been really interesting in terms of the d relationship with the NHS. The majority of our referrals, as I've said, come directly from midwifery. And we had to kind of take the difficult decision about exactly how to release this report, which is, you know, it's not just about the, the statistics and the data. It's also crucially about testimonies from the, the women that we support and indeed from the companions who are, who are observing some of these disparities and examples of, you know, poor practice that, that we've seen exist. And it was, it's become increasingly important for us to release this report, but to do it in a way that really is mindful of that relationship that we have with the NHS, because it's absolutely critical to the way that we work. And I was trying to think about the kind of what, what has sort of added to the, the success that we've had with that in terms of really strengthening the relationship. And I think it's possibly down to us being incredibly pushy, having the really good data in the first place. Um, 
being really bold and, and not sort of shying away from, from essentially from those difficult conversations. But on the NHS side, I think we've had actually an incredibly receptive and, and uh, a really positive response, particularly from the Director of Midwifery, who we're now working with really closely and looking at how we can work together with them to, to address some of these um, things, you know, through the provision of training, etc. So hopefully a useful example in terms of how that can be, that can work. Okay, so great questions uh, from, from you guys. I think Danny wants to come in and then... Wendy, and then I'm going to come back to you, Ted. I'm conscious we've got eight minutes yeah. left, so <clears throat> please, uh, please be precise. Yeah, I, I will be as brief as possible. Uh, brilliant questions. How do we shift the dial on perceptions of the importance of health? How, what opportunities within the National Care Service and um, what does effective partnership look like? Uh, I think Peter's correct. They are all in some way <laughs> interconnected. What we've found recently over the last period is... Um, we, we, the dial shifted somewhat in terms of responding to uh, racism and anti-racism and structural racism and progressing race equality, is that for a, a long time, be it within the parliament um, or broader, more s broader society, we'd be talking racism, race equality, police's job as police, or even within the context of the parliament or the government, equality unit, uh, or the Equalities and Human Rights Committee. So we'll all just go on with other areas of work and news will focus on that. Thankfully, that's changed somewhat, and there's a recognition now that tackling racism and racial inequality is critical across every policy environment, and um, because they're all interlinked. Um, so I think the argument to be put forward is the importance of health. And I gave the example of culture. Maybe if you sat down with a culture official and said, actually, you know, your decisions are going to have material impacts uh, upon people's mental health, and then how they access or the requirement to access uh, primary or secondary care. Do we go, oh, I don't think so. Health department's over there. Uh, so it's about changing the recognition that why is health important to education, or why is education important to health, why is culture important to health, why is sport important to health, housing, employment. And if essentially that comes down at the end of the day in terms of power dynamics to political decisions uh, and, and how we conceptualise, how we construct ourselves as a society. Which I go straight back to the, the, the first point I made right at the start. How, how are we cho choosing to prioritise the financial levers we have, um, the political power we have to make people's lives as substantially better as we possibly can? Um, and at the moment, health uh, isn't necessarily prioritised within the decision and budgetary making processes of other departments which directly impact health. So that's one for parliamentary, parliamentarians and government to take away and uh, to consider. And just finally, on What's effective partnership? It's not complicated. It's having the right people in the room. Um, if we want to address health inequalities, it's about having the CABSEC for health and the other cabinet secretaries and the heads of departments around the table to recognise that these things are all interlinked and we have to use all of our levers, financial and policy, at our disposal in order, in order to change that. And that's why I don't want to finish ne necessarily the opportunities there to do that and we're going to have to get better at it because the impacts of austerity are only going to get worse. But that's why yesterday's decision to cut the, the, the budget for free bus travel for asylum seekers was, was a dagger to the heart for many of us who have been campaigning for it and others who aren't in the room and obviously the people who are affected by it. Because that was basically about them being able to get a bus to go to language classes or health services or, you know, compete against social isolation. So that decision to save two million will most likely cost significantly more than two million further down the line. And that's why we need to change our perception of health creation, and that's why that was such a great question. OK. Um, when, I know if I give Wendy a chance to respond to the three questions, we have one final question, which might need to be then wrapped into each of the speakers' one-minute um, closure, if that's OK, because we're at 12.55, and I'll probably get into trouble if we're not out here on time. So, um, Wendy, do you want to yeah, have sure. a, a brief go at the, yeah, the so questions? Just very then. briefly, I'm a glass half full person, and every partnership I've ever worked with has been effective. Whether it's looking at resettlement, people coming out of prisons, whether it's looking at health, and I worked is, uh, in Kent Health Board in charge of five prisons, five prisons, five hospitals, it says it a lot, doesn't it? But, you know, doing everything except clinical work. And I found working with the clinical team, working with my team, we really made a difference. And so for me, what does effective partnership look like? And it very much depends on your success measures. But if you set out your measures and they feel realistic, 
and the people who are experiencing your service feel good about you, then I think that's what effective partnership is like. I wrote my master's thesis on partnership and I was full of, you know, the bigger the organization, the more influence and power they can, they can bring. But I've, I've now worked with very big organizations like the police, like the courts, and partnership working works if you've got respect. And I think that's where it all comes down to. What should the NCS look like? That is definitely for another day because I can wax lyrical about that one. <laughs> and the NHS, for me, I know exactly what you mean. We spend more and more and more money on the NHS. And I look at exhausted staff in the NHS, but I also look at fabulous facilities. You know, my personal experience of the NHS is superb. But I also know with my daughter, who uh, works in the equivalent in Canada, having moved from the NHS here, where she would moan and complain about all sorts of things, moving to Canada, amazing Canada, they're 10 years behind us. Wow. And that was a big shock for her and a big shock for me too. Mm -hmm. So I think we need to celebrate what the NHS has achieved. I think they do an amazing job. I'll shut up now. OK, thank you. So we've got one final question. Um, so thank you, Charlotte, Charlotte, Esther and Laura for those questions. And we'll do one final question and then I will come to, I think we'll, we'll do it in reverse order. We'll come to Wendy, then Danny, then Peter, then Marie and then Tejish, OK? Hello, my name is Margaret Bennett. I'm a community councillor. Um, and I've appreciated all the contributions that you've made. I've recently sat in several similar sessions listening to professional third sector discussing this, but the missing voice in the room was the people who were actually going to be on the receiving end. Um, about six months ago, I attended a session where we were asking the question, how do we get reach hard to reach communities? Um, we spent a whole morning on that and got nowhere. The next week I went out and I knocked on every single door in the area. That was more than 200. I had over 100 conversations. And the ideas that came from the people in that very poor community were fantastic. The willingness to be involved in improving their own lot was there. I met people who were willing to volunteer. And all they wanted was a reopening of a community flat which had previously been staffed by an NHS worker. And when the funding for that was removed, the flat was closed and has lain empty for five years. That flat was a lifeline for people because it was on their doorstep. This is a community that has more than 40 different nationalities. But people trusted the worker there. They knew that it was right there and they could go and ask for help. They could sit and have a coffee and chat to one another. And I am really disappointed that I've spent the last seven months trying to get the council to move any kind of way forward in responding to that community request. Why is that so difficult for those voices to be heard? OK, that is a great question. Um, now, bearing in mind, we're already at one o'clock, so um, we'll give you... Right, one minute to answer the question and one minute to sort all one minute for my sum up as well. Probably even 45 seconds at this 45 point. 45 yeah. seconds, <laughs> OK. <laughs> How do we reach hard to reach communities? Absolutely, it's something with, I've struggled with all my life. One of the best examples I ever saw was Street Doctor in Perth, Western Australia, where basically it was a caravan and they went round the worst areas and there was a doctor, a nurse, social security or the equivalent thereof, drug support advice, all in one little shop, all in a caravan. And that was phenomenally effective. But what they also took with them were people with lived experience. And that, that concept of using pe people with lived experience has grown in the last 20 years and it needs to continue growing because they know what they do. So in terms of summing up, thank you for allowing me to come and talk and I have really enjoyed it. I've enjoyed the questions, have been thought transforming actually. I've gone away with loads of ideas. So thank you. 45 seconds. That's brilliant. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> right, Danny, you have to... 45 seconds, yeah, yeah. there you go. <laughs> Councillor, thanks very much for your question. You're entirely right. Um, the circumstances which you've, you've ex explained is this something I'm extremely familiar with, uh, with our membership and others. Um, I spoke very much at the start about being in a sort of perpetual combat. <coughs> I don't mean that in a physical sense, but in terms of developing 
evidence and uh, advocacy to challenge some of these inequalities at a local level is something we're doing perpetually. So I'd be delighted to have a conversation again with you afterwards, because that's going to be something that's going to need to develop over time. Um, finally, just thank you to everyone. Thank you to Jess and all the team at Voluntary Health Scotland for inviting us along, and to you two as well, Chair, and my fellow panellists. Uh, and I'd just like to apologise. Usually when it goes on the bill that... Uh, Danny Boyle's speaking at that event. At least 10% of the audience is film buffs waiting to see what Danny might say about something. So you're stuck with the Bemis uh, parliamentary employee again. But thank you all. Thank you. Thanks for that, Danny. Peter. Thanks very much. And I'd still like to hear your views on uh, film to your criticism, <laughs> Danny, um, despite your shortcomings. Um, so, no, thank you for inviting me. Um, that, that question of um, hard to reach communities, I think. Probably lots of us are like, well, they're not hard to reach. They're right there. You're just not trying. Um, public agencies, are, I think there has been a real turn towards participation over the last 20 years, certainly in my experience, where um, we were absolutely hammering on doors to try and get people to, to have their voices heard uh, with, with people in power. That's, that's changed somewhat. Um, what I do think, though, and it's going back to the point that I made earlier, um, there is a there's a difference between simply presenting voices of experience, lived experience, call it what we will, and actually having some power behind it. And and some of the the poorest communities um, don't have that power and have been overlooked. And we need to find ways um, not to empower those communities, but to actually for those powers to for those communities to try and take some more power. Um, I will leave that hanging in there about how that actually happens. Um, I think, so my final comment is, if we, it goes back to what Wendy was saying, if we're to address health inequalities, we have to address inequality, we have to address poverty. Uh, and there are some very clear solutions, there are policymakers in Scotland who are working on those solutions right now, we need to find the resources and the wherewithal to implement them, not just in Scotland but at the UK level as well, I think the, the opportunities are, are right there for us right now. Um, so I'm quite hopeful about what might emerge over the next few years, but we are going to have to demand it, we are going to have to campaign for it, we are going to have to organise for it, um, and that's where I hope the Public Alliance can, can help contribute to that. So please stay involved with us and with uh, Voluntary Health Scotland as well. Thank you. Um, Marie first and then Tejesh. You might almost get the last word. <laughs> Um, yeah, I guess just touching on that question, and I was just thinking exactly the same about the idea of, of people being hard to reach, and, and absolutely they are right there. I think, though, from certainly from a, from perspective of my organisation, it, it requires trying different things and making sure that there's, um, you know, not necessarily one approach is going to work for absolutely everyone that we're supporting, and we do try different things in terms of groups and, and engaging people in different ways, and really valuing the kind of contribution that they make and making sure that if we're going to um, be asking people to you know to share their stories and to re in some cases you know really thinking about quite traumatic um, times of their lives that we have to be clear to people about what it is that we're actually doing with that information and how that's going to make a difference as well and I think that is really a challenge for third sector organisations uh, and like others have said already this has been absolutely fascinating I feel like we could go on for at least another hour <laughs> or so but yeah it's been been really fascinating and I know I'll, I'll certainly stay in contact with the panellists as well thank you. Thank you, Marie. Okay. Yeah, thanks, everybody. Um, um, I guess on behalf of Voluntary Health Scotland, we're delighted to kind of bring this panel together and to try and progress this conversation. It's challenging, and you're asking the right questions. They're difficult questions, but they are the right questions. And, and my, I guess my closing point, trying to answer a few questions there, collaboration and harder-to-reach communities. Um, there's a test of change example in Aberdeen where um, community services have taken over a, a John Lewis department store that's closed in the town centre. There's a breadth of charities... Um, health professionals, clinical staff, volunteers that utilise uh, that space uh, for basic health checks, information sharing, all those kind of things. And that's accessible. It's, it's, it's it making people welcome. There are a range of communities um, that are also uh, represented there. So it's just as a, as a small example of something that might, might be able to, to kind of help move things on. And I think technology and infrastructure is hugely important here. We can go to a fringe show and we can download the app and quickly book something and pay for it and turn up and find out where it is and get all the information we need. <laughs> But the health system doesn't have an equivalent to that, and we need to we need to, to tip the balance there. Um, and fair funding for the third sector is crucial to that. Fair funding to enable these 
third sector organisations and civil society to be a huge part of that role in keeping people well, health, healthy, happy within the community uh, and taking the pressure off public sector services. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. So just a final few words. There are evaluation forms that you will be sent if you book this through Eventbrite. Please fill them in. It's really, really helpful. And just I want to thank all the panellists, Marie Oldman, Tejish Mystery, Peter Kelly, Danny Boyle and Wendy Sinclair Gieben. Please, thank you all for being here today. I have learned so much. Um, as I said, I will be banking all this information and take it to Health Committee when, and Rural Committee, actually, when we talk about progress and ways to move forward. So um, thank you to all of you for, the, for being here today. It's really important. And there are other events going on uh, until August 23rd, I think, for this Festival of Politics. But uh, we are at 13.07 now, so I am going to <laughs> let you all get out of here. And thank you very much. <laughs>